to the Open ZKD workshop where I'll be showing um, the Stark implementation that we recently announced. So it's built in Rust and anyone who wants to code along, I really recommend that you get through these commands right now because it will download um, the, the relevant libraries. And uh, given the conference Wi-Fi, you might want to do this now. I'll keep this text up in every single slide, so you don't have to remember it or jot it down. Last numbers. Just do it while I'm talking. So, um, first of all, come on to the upper right corner, do it. Um, also, I'm assuming that if you're cutting along, you're familiar with Rust. If not, you'll be fine just listening. So what is a zero-knowledge protocol? Essentially, you have a thing that is a claim which you can prove given some additional information called a witness or the private input or the secret and that results in a proof that is usually much smaller than the um, actual thing that you're proving so smaller than the witness and you can verify this thing so you can if you have a claim and you have a proof you can verify it you can make sure that indeed a witness exists that satisfies this claim. I'll give an example soon. Now, the particular kind of proof that we've implemented here is a start. This is a protocol family developed by Eli Ben Sasson, Mikhail Lyapsev, Leo Goldberg, and others. Um, in particular, Eli Ben Sasson has been a hero in this field and has, he has been working on this for a long while. Um, and high quality protocol variants and implementations of this particular protocol family are made by Starkware. So, huge shout out to them for all the amazing work they've done in this field. OpenStark is an independent and partial implementation of the specific Stark variant used in the Stark text demo. Um, so, why Starks? Starks have some very interesting and unique qualities. They have no trusted setup, they require only Elementary mod, um, because of their simplicity, they have very good prover and verifier performance. They have small proofs, not tiny, not as tiny as the proofs you can get using pairing cryptography constructions. But this comes with a caveat. They have a unique but completely different constraint system from everything you are used to. And this makes them so interesting to so study and play around with. So, quick overview of how these things work. To prove that a program has executed on some input data, you create a computational trace of the program's execution. And you lay out this trace in a big table. Now, this trace also contains your private input. So, this table is sort of secret. But, we want to have a proof that binds you to this particular trace. And in Starks, we do this by creating a set of um, equations which you will evaluate over the trace table to prove that it is correct. We will give an explicit example of this soon. Um, but it will allow you to do that, hey, every next row, every, every next row needs to contain the sum of the previous two rows or so on. Or you can say that it needs to be equal to a particular value. So, Big slide, big scary slide, don't worry. We'll go to it bit by bit. Um, what we're gonna do is Fibonacci. So, Python-esque notation, Fibonacci is, you have A and B, we initialize A with one, we initialize B with, well in this case not one, but some secret value, right? This is going to be um, our private input. And then, we just iterate. We update A and B with the previous B value and A plus B. So this is a, a standard Fibonacci sequence. And then we return A for some index. Right. So if we have this function and we run it, we can do Fibonacci, the 200th value, starting with secret uh, value 42. And you'll end up with a large number that starts with 119. Now we want to create a zero knowledge claim on this. By the way, I'm saying zero knowledge, but actually the implementation we have is rather a succinct proof, not zero knowledge, kind of a detail. 
Um, so we want to claim that we know some number, and I'm not going to tell you that it's 42, <coughs> such that if we compute the Fibonacci sequence on this and take the 200 value, we get this big number. So this is going to be our public claim. All right. So let's go to, through the steps. The first thing we need to do is create a computational trace. So we run this Fibonacci program, and we write down at each step what the values of A and B are. So in the first row, A is 1, and B is our secret value, 42. Because we're calling it with index 200 and secret 42, so A is 1, B is 42. And then we go into the loop. So for i in 0 to index, we get a equals b. So the next a is our previous b. And you see that this happens everywhere. And the new b is the sum of the previous two. So this value here is 1 plus 42, 43. Same here. And this goes on until we hit row 200. And then we get our big number, the outcome that we want to um, demonstrate now. If you look at this trace, you can sort of see that there are four simple rules that capture the entire nature of the problem that we're trying to prove. And these rules are um, written down here. They're, they are the so-called constraints. Uh, they come in two basic kinds called boundary constraints and repeating constraints. Our boundary constraints are the first two. We need to have the first column be 1, but only for row 0. So this value here needs to be 1. Then we have another boundary constraint, similar to that one, that says that the first column needs to be our big outcome, but only on row 200. So this value needs to be our big end. And then, we need to demonstrate that it actually executed this little loop here. So, we need that for each row, the first column is equal to the previous row, the second column, and this should have been a one here, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and this holds for each row in this table. So this is a repeat constraint. Similarly, the second column for the next row is the sum of the two columns in the previous row. So this value is the sum of these two values. Now, these are four simple rules, but if you think about it, this captures everything that is intended with this claim. So if you, if you have a trace table that satisfies these constraints, You've shown that this claim works. So now we've reduced our problem from this thing here to this thing here. We still haven't made our trace table secret, but that's part of the start protocol. But in order to do that, we need to do a couple more iterations on what these constraints look like. And the next thing we need to do is we need to turn them into algebraic constraints. So instead of having equalities, we need to create expressions that are zero whenever they hold. Kind of easy. Whenever you have an equality sign, just replace it with a minus. So this thing needs to be zero on row zero. It's only zero when this thing is one. Perfect. Same here. This thing needs to be zero on row 200. You just subtract the value, and then it will be zero. Same thing for us needing to have this, these two values equal. You just subtract them. And again, when we need to have the sum, we just subtract the left-hand expression from the right-hand expression. Okay, so now we've done that. We've changed our constraints such that they are expressions that are zero whenever the constraint holds. Now we need to do a next trick. Um, the reasons for this trick are kind of mathematical, and I don't have the time to go into the details of exactly why it is the way it is, but if we have a constraint where we want i equals some value, we need to multiply this by a thing 1 over x minus omega to the power i, where omega is some constant. 
And similarly, if we want a repeating constraint, we need to multiply this thing with this expression here. When you do that, you get this system. It looks complicated, but it's really just these things multiplied by these things. And that's pretty much it, what you need to do in order to create a constraint system for the Fibonacci start. So let's show you now what it looks like if you implement this uh, using our library. Um, so is anyone trying to code along? Yes, at least one, good. <laughs> now this makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hoping you got it to the point where you can do the build release and you managed to download the things. I did the build release, but I got a bunch of build errors. It should just be warnings. start package and we just import everything. Uh, we also import the prime field that it uses. Um, for the current example, it doesn't really matter because our values are small enough. But, but, um, but if, if, if you're working with these systems in like um, practical applications, you need to know that every operation happens in some large prime field, um, which has a lot of applications. So the first thing we do is we create a struct that represents our claim. In this case, we created a struct Fibonacci claim. It, it has the index, which in the example is 200. It has the secret value, which was this very large number that we had. So it has the public value that we want to claim, the large number. And now we implement two traits on it, provable and verifiable. Let's start with provable. So what do we need to do? We need to create a trace table for this thing, um, like we said, so what, what I already have here is we have the struct itself, which is here. We have our secret value, um, which is here. And we need to output a trace table. So for mathematical reasons, the trace table always needs to have a power of two size. So we'll just round index up to the next power of two. Don't worry, we'll still get row 200 out of it. We just need to compute 256 rows. Um, and we create a trace table with this size and two columns. So let's initialize it. We start with having our leftmost thingy be one. We need to have the second column be our secret value, and then we have our for loop, where we update each value. So the, um, the first one was a copy of i minus 1 comma 1. And the second value, or b value, equal to the sum of the previous two. There we go. Now, this is rushed, so we need to be careful. There we go. Talk louder. Oh, yes. Um, so I'm adding, so if, if you're not familiar with rush, you can ignore the ampersands and the clones. They're just to satisfy the borrow checker. Let's see is, if this works. In fact, let's add a little line where we say that the value equals group. Let's print the value that we want to claim. Can you make it a bit larger? A bit larger? Yeah. Still. Oh, man. 
Yeah, do you hear? I'm not used to programming like this. That's interesting. <laughs> so yes, uh, let's let's print the value that we're trying to claim. There we go. Okay. Let's run it. Let's see if it still works. Yep. Uh, we have our claim here. So let's go to the main function. So we create our claim, index 200, and we claim that the value is, this is just a hexadecimal of the large number. We claim that our secret is 42. We print our claim struct, which you can see here. And let's just for test do claim.trace. And see if indeed on row 200 we get the value. Uh, and yes, we get the value that is the same as this one, so we implemented our trace table correctly. So that's the trace table. Now the second thing we need to do is we need to implement the constraint expressions. Uh, for that we have a little um, enum called rational expression that you import. We need to again have a number um, of rows that is a power of two, so we round it up to the next one. Here I've um, prepared those two expressions that uh, do one-off and repeated constraints. So we can just need to create a new constraint object from expressions. We give the size of our trace table, which is n by 2. We give a seed, which in this case we're not really using. And now I have a vector where I just can just enter these expressions. So um, does that, anyone remember our constraints? Here we go. The first one was the first row and the first column needs to be a constant value 1. And this needs to hold for the first row. So we say on row 0. Cool. Second constraint, very similar to the first one, except that we now need to have it match our claimed value. And we need to have it on the row that we claim. So like this. Just change the cell. Sorry? Change the cell. Change the cell. Trade. Zero one. Zero one? Um, ah, sorry. So this is actually I plus zero. But so it means that on on the row offset zero versus row offset um, So this should work like this. Now we have the repeating constraint. So before you go uh, ahead, um, uh, the on row and every row functions and omega, are those um, just for every table or are they specific to this example? Uh, they would work for every table. Um, the technical thing that happens is that omega is a root of unity of size of the trace table. And the particular prime field that we have has roots of unity only of powers of two, which is why we need to have a power of two trace table length. But this, these three lines here, you can essentially copy paste in, in any constraint system and they should work. Should that say trace 200 zero? Or? Um, no, because if you go to the example, you see here that we do i and i plus one. So the i plus is sort of implicit here. In this case, we have i plus 0, i plus 0, which matches what we do here. This is like i plus 0, and this is i plus 0. The actual, the, the, the number 200 itself comes into this on row expression. That's where the 200 is in line. It becomes a little bit more clearer with the uh, repeating constraints. So the first one we'll do is the copy constraint. We'll do a trace, and here we want i plus 1, so we say 1 here and 0, and we need to subtract trace 0, comma 1, so 1 row down and column 0, minus same row, column 1. And we want this on uh, every row. And then there is one more repeating constraint that we have. And in fact, this is the constraint where it's all, where it's all about, because this is the one that actually implements the Fibonacci. There is this sort of like boilerplate and plumbing. 
Um, and this is the line that says that it is the sum of the next row, first column, is the sum of the previous row, both columns. There we go. Uh, I'm sorry, we need to make it trace one to one. Uh, you're right, you're right, yes. So, next row, second column, sum of previous row, both columns. Okay, let's see if it runs now. <laughs> Fibonacci proof in only 32 kilobytes. It gets a lot better. The, the, the proof size grows logarithmically, so for larger and larger examples, it's significantly better. Um, now, I'll show you what, what exactly happened here. So, we're creating now a, an instance of this Fibonacci claim object with the values that we want to prove. We have our secret value that we want to hide. We create a proof by saying claim object dot proof with our secret and unwrap as a technicality here for, uh, for Rust error handling. Um, it basically throws an error if anything fails. Um, then we can convert this proof to its like binary representation. We can show that it's about 32 kilobytes. And what we can also do is we can do claim dot verify and give it the proof and make sure it's okay. Um, and then we print valid, which you see here in the line. What we can also do is create an incorrect claim. So let's take the same index and let's now change the value to something completely different. And if we take a wrong claim and try to verify it using this proof, it will actually print invalid. So, um, so much for the live coding part. Um, in conclusion, um, so we started this OpenZKP project to experiment and learn and study different proof systems. Um, like I said, we're currently having only a very partial implementation. One of the things we would like to implement next from the start proof protocol is having constraints that span offsets different from one. Like right now, we have constraints between rows uh, between one row and the next. If you want to do interesting things, you really need to have offsets that are more complicated than one row in the next. You want to be able to reference multiple rows back, for example. Uh, we want to add many more examples to this. Uh, we have, for example, an implementation of uh, the MIMC hash function. We are working on um, Vitalik's proposal for um, a proof of data availability. Uh, we are working on the example from Meta Labs where they do a verifiable delay function using MIMC. So that's a lot of fun. Um, we're working on, or we will be working on EVM verifier contracts so that you can not only, like right now, we can verify our proof in Rust. Our Rust code base compiles to WebAssembly, so we already have verifiers in the browser. We also manage to verify it inside of a substrate um, node, so any like WebAssembly enabled 2.0 blockchains will be able to verify these proofs. Um, one thing you notice in this language right now is that it feels really low level. Like we're literally writing the assembly language of constraint systems. And what you want is a higher level language where you just write the program in more or less the Python-esque language that I showed. And then it will automatically generate the logic for the trace table and the constraint systems for you. That's an interesting um, field to explore. Uh, performance is pretty decent. Um, but still has room for improvement. So that's something we can work on. And we're interested in implementing all sorts of crazy new um, zero-knowledge proof protocols that have been released over the past couple of months. A lot of them have a meaningful equivalent that is very similar to Starks in the sense that you have transparent, um, you have no trusted setup, you use polynomial commitment schemes, 
So you can look into Aurora, Marlin, Plonk, um, Fractal, etc. And we're trying to, like, there is, a, there is a nice community within the Ethereum blockchain of people researching this, and our hope is that by contributing this and inviting others to contribute to us, um, we will get an exchange of ideas and help each other move this field forward. All right, thank you very much. Question? Yes. So what guarantee do we have that the secret has not leaked into your proof? In this case? Yeah. Uh, absolutely none, because you can just compute Fibonacci reverse. Um, the other thing I, I briefly mentioned, one of the things we don't have right now is perfect zero knowledge. You need to, we need to implement a couple more things to get that. So right now, we don't even have zero knowledge, we just have succinctness. Which means that your proof only grows logarithmically in the size of the private input, instead of like... And you check, you check the proof, um, so how efficient do you can check the proof? I mean, can I just rerun the algorithm and, and check the result that way? That, uh, uh, no, it's more efficient. More so efficient. It's, 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 it's logarithmic in the original. Uh -huh. Logarithmic in the number of steps. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For example, you have um, like this seed string somewhere in there. What was that for? Ah, uh, yes. So. Um, what you want is to initialize the proof with the shared information between the prover and the verifier. So if I'm creating a proof and I'm giving it to you, um, I did, like, it would improve security if all our, inf all our knowledge we have in common was encoded in there. So what you could do is take a hash of your claim, put it in there, and then the proof is more constrained cryptographically to be for that particular um, um, public input. So it adds to security by um, committing you to this particular instance of the problem. So I, I get back to my original question. Sure. Um, so suppose that you didn't do Fibonacci, you did something else. Yes. Right? So um, again, what guarantee do you can provide that the secret has not leaked? So suppose if you have something that cannot necessarily be here, the input from the output and the other input. Um, so there's, there's two things to this question. The first is... I mean, what should I trust your proof? Basically, that it doesn't leak my secret. Yes, it's okay. So the guarantee that you get is that the verifier will not be able to learn anything more than can be learned from the public input. And that is a mathematical proof on paper by somebody else. Absolutely, yeah. That is that is a proof done by um, Ali Ben Sasan yeah, yeah, yeah. at all. I know, yeah. I know. But what if what if you, in your proof um, you simply put all the input, you know, the beginning or something? Yeah, yeah. Which is essentially what happens in in the um, Fibonacci example because you know the output is just defined by the, by the secret yeah. value, so you can just compute it backwards. It's not hard algebraically to do this. What you could also do is just like iterate through all the values if you, if you know that there is only a small set of them. And this is why the, uh, it's really important to know what the exact proof is. And the exact thing is you cannot learn anything more than you can already learn from the claim itself. If the claim contains your private input or something that allows you to derive the private input, then you have no zero knowledge guarantees. So this is something to keep in mind if you want to use these things for zero, actual zero knowledge and privacy. Be careful about what you put in the public input because you might be able to derive the private input from this if you're not careful. Um, another big remark I need to make is that right now we don't have perfect zero knowledge. We only have succinctness in the system that we have. So like the system we have is not suitable at the moment for any um, hard privacy requirements. But again, Contributions are welcome. Um, so, so something that you could maybe prove with this is that given the output being a hash function, you could verify that there was a, an input that did generate that hash. Yeah, function. actually we have an example of a, a MIMC hash free image. You can, you can find it in the repo. Cool. Okay, I'm out of time.